So this is Olber's paradox, right? If you had an infinite universe, and this is, nobody really thought about this because, you know, um, we didn't really have very good telescopes and, and such, right? But, the, you know, the, basically the, 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 the universe was assumed to be uh, infinitely old and infinitely large because if it's not infinitely old, then that deals with, like, problems of origin, right? You know, it's like, well, where did it come from? What was, and then what, what happened before that, right? Um, and and uh, we don't believe it's infinitely old anymore, but we don't know what happened before the Big Bang, right? So it's like, maybe it was like, oops, or something like that, right? Okay. Um, and then, you know, the, the universe is infinite in size, and this is a convenient assumption because if it's not infinitely large, then you have this awkward question of, okay, so then we run out of the, we get to the edge of the universe, what's beyond that? I take one more step, and it's cheese, right? And then after cheese, it's, peanut butter, and after peanut butter, it's turtles, right? In fact, there's this, this famous, um, famous joke, famous thing, right, where this, this, uh, uh, this, this cosmologist talks about the origin of the universe and all this stuff and the curvature of space-time, and, and, um, and this old lady comes up after the, the lecture, and she says, young man, what you said was you know, very interesting, but, but uh, what you need to know is that the world rests on the back of the turtle, the uh, back of a turtle, right? And the cosmologist says, aha but what does the turtle stand on, right? And uh, uh, she goes, well, why that turtle stands on, on another turtle? Right? And he goes, ah, but what's under that turtle? She goes, don't get smart with me, young man. It's turtles all the way down. Yeah? It's an kind of thing. Yeah, it's an infinite amount, right? So, you know, so, so for these paradoxes, the short version is um, we don't think the universe is infinitely old. Um, and then how you get around this whole notion of size is that, I mean, it's possible to have a finite and unbounded universe, yes? Isn't that, but you have to curve space itself, don't you? Right, here's a finite, unbounded, two-dimensional universe. Right, it is not, this is the, a finite amount of area, yes? But I'm never going to run into an edge, because all I can do is travel in my universe, correct? Right, so I'm never going to run into an edge, and this is, of course, what we think is is the deal, right? But let's go back to not knowing all that, right? Here's, here's the paradox. This is Olber's paradox, right? If the universe is infinitely old and infinitely large, right? And if we have successive shells of stars, right? The number of stars increases by r squared, right? Because the surface area of these things is 4 pi r squared, right? Okay. The intensity decreases at 1 over r squared. Well, this is a sort of an interesting thing, right? Yes? Okay. Didn't that mean that, the, that it's neutral? That the effect of being farther away is counteracted exactly by the increase of the number of stars? Yes? I mean, if I put these two together, r squared over r, over r squared is 1. Every place you look, you're going to look at a a star. And if the star is twice as far away, you're looking at four times as many stars. Yes? Yeah? Yes. Right? Okay. So the shells are the same brightness, right? Adding shells to infinity, the sky is going to be uniformly bright, right? Or another way of saying this is that every line of sight is going to end on a star because it's infinite. Space is infinite. Infinity is a long way. Eventually, you're going to run into a star. Yes? Yeah? And the second thing is, since the universe is infinitely old, assuming that it's infinitely old, right, um, we can see a star infinitely far away because it's had an infinite amount of time to get here, yes? Yes. Hasn't it? Right? This is another way to think about it, right? And, and that, that was a simpler explanation. But, but on the IB test, they put Olber's paradox on there, and you had to have this whole thing about uh, the shells of stars, and, and it was not enough to just say line of sight or something like that, right? Okay. But anyway, there, there, there it is, right? Okay. Um, so basically, that means that at night, when you look into the sky, you should see everywhere a star. But we don't see that, right? And of course, the reason we don't see that is that the universe is not infinitely old, and it's not infinitely large. Neither one of those is true. We believe it was created 13.7 billion years ago, um, and we have no real idea about the size of it. But the size we can see... Right. Uh, we're going to get to that. Yeah. <laughs> Here we have it, right? Okay.
It'd be pretty warm too around here. You know? Okay, so here's the deal with when we're talking about expansion of the universe, and this is the first. If the universe is expanding, which it is, okay, we can observe this, right? That means it's, it once was smaller and it now is bigger, right? This means that it's that it's evolving, that it's not infinitely old because you don't have to extrapolate that far back into the past and have the universe be darn small, right? Okay, um, general relativity predicts that the universe must be unstable. It must expand or it must contract. It can't just be static, right? This is the original prediction of general relativity. Einstein thinks it should be static. This is just a belief that he has because that's what he thinks it should be, right? This is not a scientific belief. This is probably more related to, to just a general belief, maybe part of his faith, right? So what he does is he gets the general relativity, he gets this theory, and he looks at this and he goes, look, it's unstable, but we know the universe has to be static, which is not true, okay? But, but he thought that it had to be static. So he actually introduces this thing for no apparent, no other reason other than just he thinks it should be static, right? So he throws in this uh, cosmological constant, which is sort of an anti-gravity thing, right? It counteracts gravity, um, and he throws it in there, and, uh, uh, well, something interesting happens. He thinks he's made general relativity, he's made it stable so that it can be static, right? He thinks he's done that, okay? Uh, but this, this mathematician, some fairly obscure mathematician who's just brilliant, right? Actually, sitting there reading Einstein's paper and going, oh yeah, that's cool, oops, he messed that up, right? And this guy's just brilliant, basically lived in poverty. This is an interesting story um, that I don't really have time to tell here. Um, but he eventually writes these letters to Einstein. Einstein doesn't know who he is, ignores his letters. Finally, one of his, Einstein's friends says, look, You've got to listen to what he's saying, okay? It's still dynamic. It's, you, you, even his addition of the cosmological constant doesn't stabilize general relativity. It's still going to either expand or contract, right? And, and so then that's this weird thing, right? If the mathematical theory that you develop says that it's got to be expanding or contracting, is that really the nature of, of the world? And of course we think it is, right? Um, Einstein goes back, looks at his analysis, realizes he's right, um, and he calls the cosmological constant the greatest mistake of my life. Yeah? So it's certainly, it's certainly he was not proud of this, right? Okay. Okay, so meanwhile, and if you're thinking of naming your child, right, if you're thinking of, of children's names, don't count out the name Vesto, right? Vesto's a fine name for a child, right? Vesto Slipher at the Lowell Observatory. Now, the Lowell Observatory, by the way, was also famous for the canals of Mars. Yes? Yeah? Which is sort of, you know, kind of a, a funny thing because uh, I believe the Italian word for grooves is canali, right? So, so Galileo, when he looked, what? Like a groove or a trough or a trench in the ground, right? So in, in Italian, Galileo described these things as canali, which if you if you thought that was canal in English, right, you'd say, oh, wow, canals, there must be, you know, ancient civilizations, and this led to all this, you know, the war of the worlds and all this stuff, right? Okay. Um, this fellow is looking at the redshift of spiral nebula, okay? Now, remember, as what is a spiral nebula? It really is a, we're looking at a, galaxy. It really, it's a galaxy, yes, okay? But we're back in the time when they wasn't universally accepted that these things were galaxies just like our own. In fact, Lowell himself, when Hubble came and said, look, here's, day, here's you know, examples of Cepheid variable stars, and these things are redshifted, they're moving away from us. Lowell took his pencil, crossed it out, and said, no, those are nebulas. There's no Cepheid variable stars there. Right? Never mind that Hubble had the Wilson you know, telescope. He could see that they really were Cepheid variable stars, right? Okay. Um, so anyway, he's looking at this. This is, you know, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but Vesto Slipher is looking at this thing, right? And all of these things, they have these spectral lines, right? And if you look at it, this is the wavelength here. This is a longer wavelength. So this is the laboratory one. That's why this one's so nice. Here is the, um, the red shifted uh, so if you're a spectroscopist, you would look at this and you'd say, oh, yeah, there's that line, right? So this thing is shifted toward the red. It's a bigger wavelength, which means it's Doppler shifted. It means it's moving away from us, right? Okay. The red shift is a Doppler effect. 
right? And 36 of 40 spiral nebulae that he can see 